Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to our global audience and welcome to the latest event in our Rebuilding the Global Economy series at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president, and it is my distinct pleasure genuinely to welcome four distinguished colleagues and friends of long standing um, to help us discuss and advance the Rebuilding the Global Economy centered around the reforms or actions and policies of the International Monetary Fund, the associated issues of debt restructuring and currency management, which are critical to global financial stability. Speaking today are Jose de Gregorio of the University of Chile, Peter Orzag of Lazard and a member of the Peterson Institute Board, Joseph Gagnon, Senior Fellow at the Institute. Jose is, of course, also a non-resident Senior Fellow at the Institute and Kristen Forbes of MIT Sloan School. I will do them not sufficient, but more lengthy biographies shortly. Please allow me to just say a word about the Rebuilding the Global Economy project. We undertook this umbrella set of activities at the Peterson Institute to try to grapple with the reality that the existential threats, and I do mean the word existential, facing the world economy right now from climate change, from technological slowdown, from mass unemployment, and of course, from the pandemic, as well as the rising potential for US, China and other conflicts need to be addressed in a way that is global and it requires cooperative outcomes, but it also requires constructive practical solutions at the national level. We at the Peterson Institute, all of our fellows, our team, and some of our board members like Peter Orzag have come together to offer very targeted memos and recommendations to key policymakers. We have started and done several events and releases relating to advice to the new administration in the US. We are now changing our focus, and this is the first in a series of five events, offering similar sorts of advice in the practical short term to the international organizations, the Bretton Wood Oregon institutions as well as some of the central banks around the world and the European Commission. We do not pretend that these organizations alone should be making the decisions, nor US and Europe alone should be making the decisions. We simply start there because they are, of course, sine qua non for progress, especially if the US is to return to a constructive role in the international economy. But we also start there because that is where our people have experience working in government, advising these institutions and residents and citizenship. We look forward in coming weeks and months to engaging with people from all around the world to bring other voices to the table, other regional views and other institutions into the mix. But that said, we are also committed to this word rebuilding. We chose it because the world, we have had a world for nearly 70 years in which increasing global economic integration human prosperity and peace were going roughly hand in hand. Not every move to global integration served the two other goals, but in general, they advanced together and more fewer people in the world are in poverty now than at any point in human history. At the same time, we all have to recognize that for at least the last 15 years, these trends have gone in reverse and the reversals have fed each other's problems. We have seen retreats from global integration we have seen steps backward in economic performance. We have seen increasing international conflict. And so we wish to rebuild not some architectural fantasy, but more than just a surface renovation. We need a place that is fit for purpose, that accommodates all the people and economies of the world, that is accessible, just like ADA for buildings in the US needs to be accessible to the differential needs of people. And it needs to be resilient to the storms of climate change, pandemics, technology that are facing us. And we believe you have to do that while we're living in it. And so we are concentrating on practical steps that can be implemented by the key policymakers and economic institutions in the next several months that can take us towards that better functioning global economy. So in that spirit, I'm proud to, again to present our four speakers today. Let me introduce them please in the order in which they will be speaking. First is Professor Jose de Gregorio, who's been a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute since March, 2014, but of course is well known and hugely important globally and in Latin America as Dean of the School of Economics and Business at the University of Chile 
and he was governor of the Central Bank of Chile from 2007 to 2011. He had served as vice governor and a member of the bank's board from 2001. He previously had been minister of the combined portfolios of economy, mining, and energy. He has a PhD from MIT and uh, is a wonderful colleague as well as a leader intellectually of real world economic advice in Latin America. He will be followed by Peter Orzag, who is CEO of financial advisory at Lazard Frere and Company, leading the firm's advisory businesses that serve companies and governments across the globe. Peter, more than most, has a biography that it's very difficult to do justice to. He has been enormously successful as a contributor to private sector finance, in public service, and in academic policy research. Importantly, of course, he was 37th director of the Office of Management and Budget in the Obama administration, a cabinet level position following the financial crisis. And he also previously served as director of the Congressional Budget Office. Prior to joining Lazard in May 2016, he was vice chairman of corporate and investment banking and chairman of the financial strategy and solutions group at Citigroup. We're very proud that he serves on the board of the directors of the Peterson Institute, as well as a number of other charitable activities. And we're also very excited to follow Peter's regular columns at Bloomberg and his many other activities intellectually, including on healthcare economics. But today, since he and Lazard played a key role in some of the recent debt restructuring in Latin America, he is going to be speaking about those issues. He will be followed by my close colleague and friend, Joe Gagnon, who has been a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute since September 2009. Prior to that, he played a critical role as visiting associate director in the Division of Monetary Affairs at the U.S. Federal Reserve Board, working with Chair Ben Bernanke and the other leaders to create QE1 and the whole overall Fed response to the global financial crisis. Previously, he served as associate director of the Division of International Finance as the culmination of a long stretch of service at the Federal Reserve. He previously served at the U.S. Treasury Department in 1994-95 and 1997-99 and has taught at the New Haas School of Business at the University of California, Berkeley. He's published widely in academic journals and is particularly well known as carrying the torch for currency intervention in a constructive fashion, picking up from his co-authored work with Fred Bergston, the Institute's co-founder, and now as his own. Uh, we have a new publication by him on the topic of U.S. currency policy, which he will be touching upon today. Finally, I'm grateful to, particularly to my friend Kristen Forbes, who is the Jerome and Dorothy Lemelson Professor of Management and Global Economics at MIT Sloan School of Management. She, like me, but perhaps more distinguished, um, was an external member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England from 2014 to 2017. She also previously served from 2003 to 2005 as a member of the White House's Council of Economic Advisors, and prior to that as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Treasury. Um, she has been honored for her academic achievements at a young age and continues to be a leader in practical economic policy. She serves in a number of advisory pos positions, including the External Advisory Group for the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. Kristen also has co-authored one paper with Joe, I believe, on currency issues and, and part of her long list of publications. Um, thank you, Kristen, for joining us. So uh, having tried to do justice to my colleagues' uh, bios, we will go into their remarks, and this is all on the record. I just ask our registered audience, if you have questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A function on Zoom. I will gather the questions and put them to our speakers after their presentations. Jose, thank you very much. Thanks, Adam. It is an honor to participate in, in this project about rebuilding the global economy. The world rightly expected a series of crises to, to afflict emerging markets and developing economies as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. This concern seems inevitable, given the massive capital outflow that we saw at the beginning of the crisis, the spike in CDS and other financial tensions. But that has not happened. Since the start of the COVID-19 crisis, the IMF has swiftly adjusted its financing facility to face the emergency. The fund has about $1 trillion for financial support, of which a quarter has been already made available, and it is ready to do more. It has acted properly and in a timely manner, given the magnitude of the crisis. The IMF policies, along with the macro stimulus undertaken by the advanced economies, as well as 
many emerging market economies and central bank actions successfully prevented crises. However, their actions do not remove concerns about financial fragility and future pro probability crisis or the human and economic toll of the pandemic. But the IMF's mission, a new emphasis on rapid response with less rigid baggage has been vindicated. The fund increased access to several facilities, created new ones, and increased overall limits under the general agreements to borrow. All of the limits has been increased only until April next year. I think that there are two priorities for the fund. The first one I'm oppressing is helping countries to fight the pandemic and support the recovery. And the second priority re regards longer term issues. So let me talk about the how to facilitate fiscal expansions with backloaded fiscal consolidation. Public finance are under stress and will continue during next year and the, and the following ones. The projections of the IMF in the latest fiscal monitor of October forecast a fiscal deficit for emerging market to increase from 5% during last year to 11% this year and stay at 9% next year. The reversion will be gradual as economies are expected to experience only a partial recovery. And fiscal policy support will be needed for at least the next couple of years. In order to avoid unnecessary early fiscal consolidation, fiscal adjustment must be backloaded and the fund must be prepared to increase lending. In this regard, I think it would be convenient for the fund to increase access on a cumulative basis to access before its 14th general review of quotas of 2016, which was 600% of the quota. That's what the old the old cumulative uh, 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 limit. And it was decreased to 435%. It was together with increasing the quota. But I think that now we could go back to the 600%. In addition for small and low income countries, access to the ra rapid finance instrument and the rapid credit facility could be doubled to 200% of quota in a year and 300% on a cumulative basis. Finally, the increased access to some IMF facilities should be made permanent and not to last until April 2021 as currently scheduled. Although the fund has made available a quarter of its firepower to emerging market economies, $250 billion, only a tenth has been deployed in the first eight months of the COVID crisis. This is $100 billion. This amount is less than what was committed in the first eight months of the global financial crisis as evidenced by Ted Truman. The current availability of private financing and the fact that many countries entered the crisis with buffers, such as sovereign wealth funds, international reserves, may explain low demand for borrowing during the current crisis from the IMF. However, we cannot rule out that issues such as stigma and access constraint are preventing some economies from seeking financing. And we should review that. For this reason, the fund should revise access and qualification mechanisms. For example, understanding why so few countries have applied to the flexible credit line and the current and uncertain world is passing. Is it a result of a stigma or too strong conditions? One wonders whether a confidential pre-qualification process, something that many of us has been arguing for a long time, could be implemented for FCL. And also for the short-term liquidity line that was recently uh, uh, implemented. Moreover, as the health crisis prolongs in some emerging market, the fund could create a new pandemic support facility that was proposed by Fisher and Masaray, which should provide fiscal and balance of payment support specifically to deal with the health crisis for a period of three years. But this is also an opportunity to strengthen the role of the fund, not only in the current crisis, but also in the longer term. And for this reason, the second priority contains three steps to increase global resilience to crisis. The first step is to increase availability of resources. In terms of resources, it seems that one trillion may be enough firepower under current circumstances. However, a deterioration of financial condition in emerging market may require additional resources. Moreover, the crisis will be long, and therefore the fund should increase its firepower. 
This is like having excess reserves in emerging markets. Although they, they may not be used, they serve as a good insurance and also prevent volatility. Therefore, a new one trillion issue of the fund's special drawing rights would be desirable. However, SDRs are allocated to member countries according to quotas. And in this case, a non-proportional allocation could be achieved by creating a common pool overseen by the fund to expedite financial support to countries in need. The common framework for the treatment be joined. This is the, the, second, the second step is to, that the world needs more debt relief. And I think that we'll keep discussing this. But the common framework for debt treatments be joined the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, the DSSI, endorsed by the G20 and the Paris Club, this common framework, just some days ago, is a step forward. However, it's insufficient. The DSSI originally was designed as a debt service postponement for 73 low and lower middle income economies. In contrast, the common framework is debt relief on a case-by-case -case basis, which is essential for countries that have become insolvent. With no debt relief, there will be no full debt service. Recognizes this in the common framework is realistic because there is insolvency. Another important advantage of the common framework is that it includes the private sector, which implies that the question of whether an autonomous public financial institution should enter or not the DSSI, because it is private for some or it is public for others, is no longer an issue in the common framework, since this institution should participate. The common framework should be also extended to emerging market deemed to be insolvent. But we know that there are issues uh, of moral hazard in countries that have been historically fiscally responsible and shouldn't be granted this uh, 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 debt relief under the common framework. For this reason, an extension to emerging market economy should be only for those countries that have reached insolvency as a result of the COVID crisis. The IMF should also work with the G20 on new initiative for their sovereign restructuring. In the meantime, it should also incentivize the use of financial instruments that make public finance of emerging market more resilient, such as bond indexed to commodity prices or to GDP. More in general, state contingent bonds. And finally, the IMF should continue developing the integrated policy framework. In terms of policy advice, the fund has changed. For example, it's beyond the benefits of proceeding a fiscal policy, a chain rate intervention, and capital flow management have been gradually changing since the Asian crisis to a more realistic approach, recognizing that one size does not fit all. The fund has been recently developing an integrated policy framework which focuses on the optimal combination of policy tools to face volatile capital flows. For this reason, monetary policy and a chain rate flexibility could be complemented with macroprudential measures capital flows measurements, and for exchange intervention. This is a valuable exercise founded in rigorous economic analysis and review of experiences. However, it should not be used to support inconsistent policies or to ignore fiscal sustainability. For example, foreign exchange intervention and capital controls cannot be used to, for sustaining a chain rate misalignment. It is also necessary to be clear about what is the target for different combination of policies and their implications of external adjustment. Are capital controls aimed at exchange rate competitiveness or capital flows volatility and financial stability? What would happen if all emerging markets decide to stabilize the currency when facing a, a global depreciation of the dollar? And we would enter in all the discussion that we will hear more on currency manipulation. Having a flexible approach to macroeconomic policies is important. However, it should start with recognizing the role of fundamentals and the difficulty to reach clear-cut general recommendations. This is a technical, not an ideological issue. In any case, it's an advance from the old view that all problems are fiscal and therefore all solutions require fiscal tightening. This more flexible approach has been very relevant during the last two global crises. Uncertainty in the global economy is daunting. So the fund has to be prepared for these contingencies and the speed and flexibility it has already shown in the first year of the crisis and add building blocks to a safer and more resilient global financial system 
essential. Just to summarize my little, uh, my, my key priorities, facilitate fixed expansion, backload is fixed consolidation within the context of the current crisis and the current instrument and expansion of the instrument and, and time. And finally, three steps to increase global resilience, increase resources at the IMF, more debt relief, and develop the integrated policy approach. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose. Uh, it is terrific to have your perspective from the small open economy and the emerging markets, as well as the integration of the short-term response of the fund and the need to think about the long-term. And it's also the most sensible explanation I've heard of the so-called integrated framework. So thank you very much. Jose's memo, like all of our materials for rebuilding is available on the PIA website and the rebuilding microsite, as will be all the videos of today's remarks. Please let me now turn to the Honorable Peter Orzag, our member of our board uh, from Lazard to talk about debt restructuring. Thank you, Adam, uh, and good to be with all of you. And I'm gonna go off piece for just one minute uh, at, the, at the beginning, because several of the things that Jose said, I just wanted to highlight. I think, uh, and this is admittedly m a bit more for the advanced economies than the emerging uh, market economies, but this combination of upfront fiscal expansion and backloaded fiscal consolidation, as Adam knows, is something that I've been uh, very much embracing for a long time, the so-called barbell, is, is a concept that, that demands, frankly, a lot more attention. It is typically argued that the backloaded fiscal consolidation is not politically feasible. And I think we are living in the United States through a dramatic counterexample. Uh, the Social Security retirement age is increasing as we speak um, because of changes that were put in place in the early 1980s with almost no political opposition. So that's one, one comment. Second comment is uh, I am concerned, and this now gets to uh, back on the mountain of where I'm supposed to be, uh, that uh, the financial markets and the policy community have now basically dismissed the possibility that low rates will not remain here forever. Um, I think as a central forecast, uh, projecting continued low interest rates, as far as I can see, makes sense. But uh, we should have some humility that whenever the conventional wisdom becomes so convinced of itself, uh, the risk of an error is higher than one might uh, otherwise believe, and at least build in some contingency planning for what we would do if that situation, uh, if low rates were to uh, reverse themselves, which then speaks to a lot of the uh, questions that I was asked to, to address involving emerging market uh, debt and how we can better prepare for uh, any future crises, um, which would be exacerbated if uh, global rates increased from their current um, position. So we, uh, in the memo, put forward six ideas for trying to attenuate future debt crises um, based in part on the experience that Lazard has had in uh, negotiating on behalf of Argentina, Ecuador, and other uh, countries, uh, governments across the globe. Uh, the first one involves a standstill. So in a situation like a, a future pandemic, like the one that we uh, have lived through, um, automatically staying payments um, so that uh, countries have a bit of breathing room while they deal with a crisis. Uh, the DSSI, I think, as everyone knows, is very well intentioned, but has gotten um, no pickup. And the reason for that, I think, is multifold, but it includes that uh, there is complexity involving the rating agencies and whether a standstill uh, would be deemed to be um, problematic from uh, a ratings downgrade perspective. So the idea is that we need more automaticity into a standstill. Uh, this needs to be coordinated with the rating agencies up front, and it probably should be triggered by some sort of, uh, I would think, IMF um, certification that we are in a crisis and therefore the standstill kicks in. Um, but in any case, we've got to have more automaticity and it's got to be better coordinating with the rating agencies to have any future uh, debt suspension uh, initiatives work better than the current one has. Uh, 
Second, I think we need to revisit the role of the IMF itself. Uh, Argentina provides a very dramatic example here where uh, the IMF was not only uh, supposed to be the judge, but it was also the country's largest creditor. That puts the IMF in a, an awkward position relative to the other private creditors, or sorry, uh, relative to the private creditors, the other creditors, uh, because it raises questions about their, um, their ability to uh, be fair and impartial at the same time that they have a very large exposure to the country. So uh, obviously it's, a, it's easy to say to avoid that kind of situation in the first place, um, but I would just reemphasize that it creates uh, a significant amount of tension in the process. And then there are also questions about the interest rate that the IMF uh, should charge um, given its preferred creditor status, acknowledging that uh, an excess interest rate is one of the tools that the IMF uses to try to discourage countries from borrowing heavily in the first place. So back to my uh, former point, uh, but nonetheless, it, it exacerbates uh, perceived inequity by many private creditors and I think is worth uh, revisiting. Third, um, there's often a bid-ask spread in many of these negotiations where differences of opinion regarding the future evolution of the economy loom large, uh, and creditors wonder why they have to take a large haircut if the economy still bounces back um, rapidly. Uh, there has been limited use of so-called value recovery instruments or uh, contingent um, instruments uh, to try to bridge that kind of gap. Um, one of the impediments, there are many impediments to take up of VRIs, but one of the impediments is that they are sui generis and bespoke to each situation. So um, spending time now to have uh, the IMF lead the way in designing uh, what a VRI should look like, how should it be in, I mean, just to give some, some of the detail around that, should it be uh, based on GDP? Should it be based on exports? Um, should it be based on the growth rate of uh, those indicators or should it be based on the level? Are there catch-up periods? Um, all of these details really matter and to be negotiating them in the middle of an overall uh, debt negotiation often proves to be too, a bridge too far, which is exactly what happened, for example, in the recent Argentina negotiations. So pre-wiring that I think could help um, to significantly expand take up, even though it won't, uh, it won't solve all of the issues involved with low take up uh, of those value recovery instruments. And they would, if, if we could get them working, they would help to bridge the gap uh, between creditors and debtors, at least along um, one important dimension. The fourth set of ideas involves uh, the coordination problem uh, among creditors, which has become more extreme over time um, as uh, new creditors have uh, entered the, the landscape. So we've moved from a small number of banks holding a disproportionate uh, share of sovereign debt to a much more disparate set of asset managers um, holding uh, such debt. The use of collective action clauses, I think, is one of the significant advances in the field uh, over the past uh, decade. Um, but many of those, the details involving those collective action clauses, which help to solve the coordination problem by basically avoiding um, a small share of creditors persisting as holdouts and, and blowing up the entire deal. Uh, the memo that uh, is on the Peterson website goes through at least a little bit of the detail, but there are two different kinds of collective action clauses that are common, single limb and dual limb. Uh, in our view, there are some modifications to the single limb um, collective action clauses that would help to facilitate future uh, debt negotiations. And I find it interesting that in a, in a recent IMF, uh, uh, analysis of the topic, you would think that perhaps uh, the tighter the collective action clause, uh, the worse the bond would trade, the higher the interest rate that you'd have to pay. But in fact, they, the IMF has found the opposite, that uh, many of these innovations actually lead to um, uh, results that suggest uh, more attractive pricing and lower interest rates as a result. And we could come back to some of the reasons uh, for that.
Fifth idea involves um, the Paris Club. Um, the big problem with the Paris Club today is it's missing a massive uh, sovereign uh, uh, bilateral creditor uh, in the form of China. Uh, bilateral credit from China exceeds that of the Paris Club uh, in total at this point. And so having uh, China sit outside of that process really uh, limits the ability of the Paris Club to function in the way that it was designed to do. And we propose uh, changing the rules so that Par the Paris Club includes China rather than excludes it. And then the final idea involves something that's outside of the uh, international monetary regime's uh, permit, but has a significant effect on the negotiations nonetheless, which is that uh, many sovereign contracts are written uh, under New York law. In New York State, the prejudgment interest rate, that is if something gets litigated, uh, the interest that's accumulating during the litigation was set in nominal terms in 1981. It has not been adjusted since, so it's set at 9%. Um, as inflation rates have come down dramatically since then, the real interest rate that is charged uh, from you know before the judgment is reached has re reached excessively high levels, and that can create complications uh, in the negotiating process because it is um, substantially off market and should be updated. So uh, there are just some ideas to try to make uh, future negotiations work uh, better than previous ones. But I would finally just note very briefly that despite the, um, the complications, there have been a whole series of debt negotiations, including Argentina and Ecuador, that were successfully completed in the middle of a pandemic done entirely virtually for the first time in, in sovereign debt negotiating history. And back over to you, Adam. That's terrific, Peter. Uh, thank you. And congratulations to you, the fund, the creditors, and everyone involved on that last accomplishment. But it's great to have you combining not just the success in the cases, but thinking about the system going forward. And again, your memo is available. We've just redistributed it on Twitter. A uh, reminder to our registered participants, please put Q&A, use the Q&A function to submit questions to our panelists. Let me now turn to my colleague, Joe Gagnon, who's going to speak about currency manipulation from a U.S. point of view, but it is a critical issue to the U.S. approach to the fund and the fund's approach to the financial system. Joe. Oh, thank you, Adam. Uh, to begin with, though, I'd like to, to join with my colleagues, uh, Jose de Gregorio, also Maury Osfeld, and uh, Ted Truman in calling for an increase in the capital resources and SDR allocations uh, of the IMF, the World Bank, and the regional development banks. These international financial institutions need to grow to keep up with the growing modern world. Uh, and so I'm, I'm not gonna repeat what Jose just said. Uh, and you can also look up uh, Maury's and Ted's uh, contribution on PIE's Rebuilding the Global Economy webpage. Uh, so instead I'll focus uh, my time on um, uh, what Adam just said, which is what the United States uh, should do to narrow uh, global trade imbalances and also to restore the IMF to its original role uh, of uh, being a referee in the international monetary system. Uh, achieving more balance and sustainable growth has been the leading goal of the IMF and the G20 countries since uh, at least 2008. Uh, and trade imbalances did shrink significantly between 2008 and 2010. Since 2010, however, there's been little further progress and there is some risk of a renewed widening going forward. Uh, from the US point of view, uh, this issue matters because a trade deficit uh, requires borrowing from the rest of the world and no country in history has borrowed more from other countries than the United States. Uh, US net debt to the rest of the world reached an astonishing 69% of GDP in the second quarter of 2020. Um, and it really makes no sense for the world's richest large country to borrow so much. Uh, the current environment of low interest rates does keep the burden of this debt down, uh, but when correctly measured, uh, net interest payments on this debt to the rest of the world were nearly 1% of GDP last year. And over time, uh, that burden would grow as long as we have uh, continue to keep borrowing more. Um, 40 years of trade deficits have also skewed the U.S. economy 
away from manufacturing. Uh, and this is politically sensitive in the US as manufacturing jobs are viewed as particularly good jobs for workers without college degrees. Uh, growing manufacturing jobs by shrinking the trade deficit was the number one economic policy issue of Donald Trump's 2016 uh, campaign. And it does strike a chord with a significant fraction of the voters. Uh, I estimate that eliminating the trade deficit would boost US manufacturing output about 16%, which would be a notable achievement. Um, now the future burden of the debt and the cost of stabilizing it uh, will only grow uh, the, as long as the deficit continues. Um, and it's not urgent, it's been a long running problem and it's not um, uh, going to blow up anytime soon, but it is better to deal with it sooner rather than later because you make the ultimate cost uh, lower. Um, conflict over exchange rates and trade imbalances, I think is likely to play a greater role in macroeconomic policy uh, going forward uh, with monetary policy constrained by the zero lower bound on interest rates, countries are tempted to use exchange rates, uh, exchange rate policies uh, to get growth at their uh, trading partners expense. Uh, and we need global rules to prevent abuse. And this is the job the IMF actually was created for to referee the international monetary system. Now, uh, the IMF has set up the analytical framework for this task in its annual external sector reports, uh, which assess the global pattern of trade and establish norms for surpluses and deficits according to each country's characteristics. And this is part of the bigger picture that Jose mentioned, which was the sort of integrated policy framework, uh, which, which I also like, uh, and I share Jose's appreciation. Uh, I'm gonna focus on a specific element of it, which, uh, which I think is particularly important for the IMF, but it's not the whole picture. But anyway, the IMF uh, trade balance norms uh, are broadly sensible for uh, large countries, the largest countries. Uh, for the US and China, uh, they uh, propose trade balance norms. And I'm referring here to the current account balance, which I think is the best measure of trade. Uh, for the US and China, trade balance norms of around zero. Uh, for elderly and slow growing economies like the Euro area and Japan, we have trade surplus norms of one to 3% of GDP. For younger, faster growing economies like uh, Brazil, India, Mexico, we have uh, modest deficits of one to 3% of GDP. Any trade imbalances that uh, uh, would be considered excessive and undesirable if they exceed these norms significantly for uh, a prolonged period of time, more than just two or three years. The IMF should, I think, take the next step and actually insist that exchange rate policies of its members uh, should be aimed uh, if they're being used at narrowing the imbalances and not widening them. Uh, I think that's a reasonable uh, prescription. And what do I mean by exchange rate policies? Well, this includes foreign exchange intervention, which is official buying and selling of foreign currencies, and also capital flow measures, which as I mentioned, controls or taxes on capital inflows or outflows that affect exchange rates. Um, exchange rate policies aimed at narrowing imbalances should be allowed, but not required. Uh, policy actions to sustain or widen imbalances would be prohibited. Uh, I would not have targets or not need targets or bans on exchange rates per se. It's just a matter of taking steps that lean against the wind uh, if you want uh, and not to do the opposite. Uh, IMF staff should review these policies in the annual article four surveillance. Uh, but a key gap in all the things I've outlined is that we would need to agree on meaningful sanctions to actually enforce these rules. I'll come back uh, later to what the US can do uh, in that regard. First, though, I'd like to discuss a serious problem uh, in the IMF's analysis of some small and medium-sized surplus economies. The IMF staff assume that uh, foreign exchange intervention has no effect in these economies uh, with open and sophisticated financial markets, but the data overwhelmingly reject that assumption. And my latest policy brief uh, at the PIE website uh, shows that trade balances over time are very strongly correlated with uh, countries' foreign exchange intervention. And in fact, it explains the lion's share of differences across country, which is quite amazing, uh, including for these countries with uh, open and sophisticated capital markets. So thus the IMF is wrong to conclude that double digit trade surpluses uh, when you have this massive uh, intervention are not distortionary. Uh, in fact, they are the result of distortionary policies and these countries shouldn't be getting uh, very large positive uh, norms for trade surpluses. Now, 
as uh, Fred Burson and I uh, documented in our 2017 book, uh, excessive foreign exchange intervention and outright currency manipulation were major problems in the early years of the 21st century, but they diminished notably after 2014. In 2020, however, there are some worrisome signs of renewed currency manipulation in several small and medium-sized surplus economies, including again, many of the countries the IMF analysis has overlooked in the past. Um, and now Lily, you could uh, put up a slide, I guess, at this point. Um, if foreign exchange intervention in surplus of countries uh, continues at the pace of the first nine months of 2020, uh, the US should consider adopting a policy of countervailing currency manipulation. Uh, countervailing currency intervention involves buying an amount of a country's currency uh, exactly equal to its excessive purchases of other currencies. Uh, this would neutralize the effect of currency manipulation on trade imbalances, uh, and quick action in this regard is needed to head off this worrisome uh, buildup of intervention uh, manipulation. Aside from countervailing uh, currency intervention to prevent this new burst of currency manipulation, uh, the United States can afford to move slowly. Right now, the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and recession is more urgent. Uh, it's also important to rebuild the frayed U.S. relationships with the international financial institutions and with our G20 partners. However, if the U.S. trade deficit persists or grows into 2022, uh, I, the United States should adopt what I call a balanced dollar policy. And this would involve using modest foreign exchange purchases to weigh on the dollar and start rebalancing trade over a period of four to five years. Over time, if foreign exchange intervention by itself proves insufficient, the United States should consider taxing capital inflows to reduce upward pressures well, on the dollar. We're approaching the end of your time. Okay, yes. Um, and uh, again, it's important to stress that there would be no targets or limits on exchange rates. Finally, uh, I would to maintain global growth uh, with this rebalancing, surplus economies would need to boost aggregate demand with easier monetary fiscal policies. And fortunately, these economies have a lot of fiscal space as they have less debt and they've been running fiscal surpluses until recently. Um, the world economy can no longer rely on a sole US engine of growth, especially if that requires ever larger US fiscal deficits and trade deficits. Uh, thanks for listening. I'll now turn it back to you, Adam. Thank you, Joe. Um, sorry, but we want to make sure we have time for everybody as well as questions from the audience. So Kristen, thank you for joining us to offer your views and your comments. Thanks very much, Adam. So this is a rich set of suggestions. You've covered a lot of ground and given that there's a short amount of time and we're already behind, I won't try to take on everything for my responses. I'm just gonna focus on one aspect of most of your proposals, which was with regarding the international debt framework and what can be done and what's the role of the IMF and World Bank. So one reason I think this is worth focusing on for my one, one topic is that this is an area that is extremely timely right now. Um, as has already been mentioned, there's even been progress in the time since Adam put together this panel and the memos were written in what is happening in the international community. Yeah, the G20 common framework that Jose talked about has already partially or taken some steps to address some of the issues on the table. For example, this new common framework is extending the principles of the Paris Club to all G20 countries not in the club, which is code for including China, which has been a key part missing in debt restructuring. Um, also, another key part of this common framework that was just announced by the G20 is that any borrower that receives relief must seek a similar deal from other creditors. In other words, getting the private sector involved uh, more concretely than has been done in the past. So already two of the issues that Peter, for example, talked about in his memo or have been partially addressed or in the process. Um, but that's only for a subset of countries, a subset of situations. Um, this is only a start. This is not going to be enough. There is much more that needs to be done, particularly as countries have seen their debt increase sharply as they respond to COVID. Um, even if things recover quickly, even in the more positive scenarios, there are a number of countries that are probably not going to be able to sustain debt at current levels. And that's in a positive scenario. Then there's also the contingency that Peter suggested we need to have on the table, whether you believe it's the baseline or not, which is that advanced economies raise interest rates faster than expected, possibly because of higher inflation. If that happens, a lot of this debt that looks barely or maybe sustainable at extremely low interest rates into the indefinite future will quickly become unsustainable and we could have a round of rapid defaults. 
So more needs to be done. And more needs to be done also because what we have learned time and time again is that when countries have unsustainable debt, if that restructuring is put off, this often causes countries to gamble for redemption, to take shortcuts, to alleviate pressures in the short term, which then make the problem accelerate and become much harder to deal with later on. Um, for example, we've seen time and time again, and we're seeing some of that now, um, as debt problems increase, it's tempting for countries to issue more debt in foreign currency, which seems cheaper now, but then when the currency depreciates, it quickly spirals to unsustainable levels. You see countries shifting to issue more short-term debt, which again is cheaper now, but then harder to roll over, can bring a crisis to a head right when least convenient. You see countries promise valuable resources as collateral that then aren't available for part of a debt restructuring or aren't available to yield revenues in the future. And you see countries shift resources towards paying debt to just try to keep uh, rolling it over short term instead of spending it on needed productive investments. For example, today is spending as much on healthcare. So the bottom line is if countries aren't sometimes pushed to restructure sooner rather than later, they can end up in doom loops. They create slower growth, higher debt, fewer resources later on to then negotiate as part of debt restructuring, which makes it harder to get an agreement. So how do we get around these problems? How do we get countries to tackle some of their needs to restructure earlier or just try to get their debt on a more sustainable path so that we can avoid these situations going forward? A um, lot of good ideas bouncing around, some of which have been discussed in this panel. Um, some have surprisingly cute names, for, especially considering that they are come up with by lawyers that are often not known for coming up with particularly cute names. Uh, let me just mention a couple. Um, one I, I particularly like the name of is Yank the Bank Provisions, which make it easier to kick a lender out from a syndicate if it prevents a deal. Another one, which I believe Peter mentioned, is Bendy Bonds. Um, this allows the, if there's a crisis, it allows the issuer to extend the maturity and defer interest payments for a couple of years. Um, I think that's a very logical idea. And then there's negative pledge clauses that prevent a borrower from using valuable assets as collateral to other creditors in contingent debt instruments. Um, debt instruments that automatically account for external shocks or the state of the economy. There's a range of different instruments that fall under this heading. Um, Peter mentioned some, Jose mentioned some. It could be catastrophe bonds, hurricane bonds that pay out in the case of a hurricane or catastrophe, however defined. Could be uh, bonds that are linked to the price of a commodity for a commodity exporter. It could be bonds where payouts are linked to growth rates, GDP contingent bonds, whole range. Um, these, of all of these different suggestions and proposals, uh, these proposals for contingent debt instruments are the ones that I would focus on. I think these are difficult. The details matter, as Peter said, uh, but contingent debt could directly address some of the biggest issues out there with debt restructuring. Um, they are an automatic way to allow countries to hedge against different risks. Countries pay more when they have the ability to pay more. When they're hit by some sort of shock and they can't pay more, they automatically pay less. And then this can avoid the need to go to the table and have difficult prolonged restructuring that can often lead to these deadweight losses and doom loops. So contingent debt makes a lot of automatic sense. It's an automatic way of adjusting to the uncertainty in the world around us today. I mean, even in normal stable times, when looking at debt sustainability for advanced economies, it is very hard to know what is sustainable. Modest tweaks to key variables like your RNG, your interest rate and your growth rate can lead to very different conclusions about what debt is sustainable. And those variables are hard enough to predict for again, advanced economies in stable times. If you shift to emerging markets with more volatility in their growth rates and interest costs and shift to a situation like today with COVID, where there's tremendous uncertainty about how quickly countries will recover, if there will be long-term impacts on productivity and growth, it is impossible to predict out what ability will be to pay for different countries. And that's before you get shocks and surprises, which always happen. So just automatically contracting in some way to adjust for this uncertainty could be a way to get both sides at the table, get your creditors and debtors at the table and deal with some of these issues around sustainability and restructuring debt sooner rather than later. So they make a lot of economic sense. Then the question is, how do you do this? These are ideas that many are not new. They've been on the table for a while. Um, and what can the IMF and World Bank do, which is a the theme of this panel? 
So I had a couple suggestions for how uh, the IMF and World Bank could be part of a shift to more uh, contingency and debt contracts. First, um, and this builds in something Peter said, just help with some of the technical details, help draft contracts to make state contingent contracts work. These are one of these um, set, set of issues where the details do matter. I don't think we wanna get into them in this panel, but little details, even like if a country's payments are linked to GDP or GDP growth, what measure of GDP? What measure of GDP growth? That sounds uh, like something uh, small, um, but one of the earliest state contingent contracts linked to GDP didn't specify what measure of GDP was going to be used, which then led to fights about how much is paid out. So this is unfortunately, the technical details matter, and that's where the IMF World Bank are very well positioned to help provide advice so you don't have some of the mistakes that we've learned from in the past. A second area where the IMF and World Bank could play an important role is to try to help countries draft similar contracts, um, similar structures, so then they can be combined into a bigger, more liquid market. So each contract isn't sui generis, again, building on what Peter said. That makes it harder for investors to understand. It makes each issuance less liquid. People will be more hesitant to buy it. If you hit a number of countries issue with similar, con similar types of bonds, you'd have a bigger, more liquid market, easier to understand and get investor interest. And that would get around the novelty premium and the liquidity issues that happen with any type of new instruments. Um, a third suggestion is the IMF and World Bank could be involved in signing off on key variables that are necessary for state contingent contracts. For example, they could sign off on what the price of, is of a commodity or of GDP growth that will be critical for how much is paid out in these state contingent contracts. Then you're taking some of that outside of the governments that have to pay and um, creditors might be more comfortable buying this debt if they were confident you'd have an outside arbiter signing off on some of the key variables that determine payments. Um, and that gets Kristen, right, as we see, for example, with Argentina. Kristen, I'm sorry, we're going to have to ask you to wrap up so that we can get in okay. a couple of questions. Okay, uh, very quickly. Fourth, the IMF could make these contracts required is if country wants to get a big loan, one of these new packages, you could require they also try to restructure some of their debt with state contingency. And then finally, IMF World Bank could even include some contingency in their contracts. When they make loans, they could be, say, extended repayments or extended interest rates if some sort of shock hits. So I'll summarize, lots of great proposals on the table. Um, but if I could focus on one set of proposals right now to prioritize, I'd focus on improving the structure for international debt restructuring. And amongst that set of issues, focus on promoting more state contingency and debt contracts. Thank you. Chris, and thank you for the very clear prioritization. That's the kind of thing we need from people in your position as well as in this project. Um, let me turn quickly to Peter. Um, both Kristen's remarks and a number of the questions from our audience raise the issue of how one thinks about debt sustainability. Um, and also you mentioned the idea of there is room for interest rates potentially to jump. We shouldn't assume they stay low. And so if you could just give a bit more expansive response on your thoughts about how fragile debt sustainability assessments are, what might drive jumps in interest rates, whether this means we need to treat some dividing line between emerging market and lower income countries differently. Just a, an initial teaser on how you would think about these issues, including some of what Kristen raised. Sure. So I think the most important thing to remember about any debt sustainability analysis is it's based on a set of projections. Uh, the uncertainty bands are typically massive. Uh, even here in the U.S., people forget uh, we forecast the deficit out, you know, three, two or three years from now. And if you look at the Congressional Budget Office's uh, forecasting accuracy, the budget deficit tends to be, uh, you know, presented as if it's this precise estimate, 3.2% uh, of GDP, and no one asks, well, what's the confidence interval around that? And you know, three years out, it's typically like plus or minus 5% of GDP. So what they're really saying is it's somewhere between a surplus of 2% and a deficit of 8%. I don't know. And yet we get into uh, the debt negotiations and the debt sustainability analysis that the IMF and others produce has the same feature, which is that they're very precise point estimates of exactly what the world is going to look like 
when everyone knows that's very unlikely to be the case. So it comes back to the point that Kristen was, I think, properly emphasizing, which is we can take a lot of that uh, uncertainty out of the equation if there is more contingent uh, dimension, contingency dimension to the debt instrument itself so that it automatically responds to the way that the world uh, turns out to be as opposed to the way the spreadsheet uh, suggests it will be. With regard to interest rates, and again, I think this is a really important point because uh, uh, I think it's something that um, has come up uh, repeatedly, in, including, I, I wasn't able to catch it, but I believe that Olivia Blanchard made the same point in response to uh, a recent uh, paper that uh, Jason Furman, another Peterson uh, fellow, and Larry Summers, a member of the board, uh, argued, which is, we have, um, I, I think it, it, there are good reasons for why interest rates are low, uh, but we are kind of betting the farm on that always being the case. Um, there are a whole series of reasons from potential inflationary pickup to uh, underlying demographics, which was also a subject of a previous Peterson uh, event for why interest rates might uh, turn up again. Again, really important, not saying they will, but this 100% certainty, there's no chance that they won't, strikes me as being a mistake. And it would be better to build in the tail risk of, well, let's make sure that we're resilient, even if that were to turn out uh, to be the way the world looks. So a lot of it then circles back to exactly what we were discussing, which is uh, instruments that and processes that let you handle a situation like that uh, even better. It's also a motivation, frankly, for the barbell, coming back to Jose's comments. Um, if you have backloaded fiscal consolidation that's coupled with the upfront fiscal support that the world needs, both to deal with the pandemic and to uh, deal with underlying secular stagnation uh, concerns, uh, that is also an insurance policy against a rapid rise in interest rates in the future. Terrific. Thank you for your concision and clarity, Peter. Uh, and I attest that you've been raising the barbell idea for fiscal policy for some years, and it's ever more applicable. In the interest of time, I'm now going to do a quick round of questions, one for Joe, one for Jose, and one for Kristen, and then we will conclude. But I'll let each of you answer first. Um, Joe, uh, Suman Barry raises an issue that I know many have shared in response to some of your work and your current calls. I mean, emerging markets and small open economies do accumulate reserves, citing the inadequacy of the global safety net and the need for self-insurance. So is this, you know, if, if should the U.S. be going ahead with this, even if the IMF is not providing a more extensive safety net? Um, is this really you're complaining about uh, Korea and Switzerland and not emerging markets? How, how should we see this from the other perspective? Yes, I, well, I think countries need uh, reserves, a significant amount of reserves. Uh, frankly, strangely, the U.S. may <laughs> need more reserves too. Uh, even though reserve currency countries obviously need less reserves, but they don't need zero. And reserve needs differ a lot across countries. Uh, my concern is mainly with countries whose reserve holdings are, you know, far in excess of, of any any reasonable metric. That, that's, that's my only concern. I think some of the countries that we see have 100% of GDP or more in reserves, which is hard to justify on any insurance basis. So just one second. So, so if I'm sitting there, if I was Jose a decade or more ago in Chile or Stan Fisher as governor of the Central Bank of Israel, um, should I be scared the U.S. is going to bully me? Well, <laughs> yeah, I can't guarantee, uh, you know, as we've seen, um, the U.S. may very well bully other countries, and I think that's unfortunate. I certainly would not recommend bullying anyone who's got a reasonable amount of reserves, especially if they have a current account deficit. There's the rule, the, the, the criteria for currency manipulation, basically, if you have a current account deficit or even a small surplus, you're not even going to be considered. So it's only targeted at those with very large excessive surpluses and very large amounts of reserves. Thank you. Um, Jose, turning to you, two questions that are not exactly related, but, but are both in the spirit of what's been said. First, as Peter linked back to you on the fiscal policy, what kind of contract or institution 
do you set up to enforce this later payment, later fiscal uh, prudence to make up for fiscal borrowing now? Well, borrowing now may be prudent, but I mean, later fiscal restraint. How do you enforce that? And, and secondly, just without trying to be too provocative, I mean, what's your response to, what's your thinking of Joe's proposal for the US to take on this more stringent currency uh, activism? Thank you. Uh, and let me take it very briefly. Regarding the first one, there, there is an important issue, and I think that countries should, if they are requesting for some sort of international financial uh, uh, help in terms of funding, because this is not a market thing, but I think that it's quite important, and, and I think that many uh, emerging markets is doing, is to set up sort of independent committees uh, to monitor fiscal accounts and also to propose fiscal rules. So as long as you propose a fiscal rule, a credible, a credible medium-term fiscal consolidation, I think that can increase your credibility in order to access private markets, but also in order to, in, in case of need, in order to go to the IMF. So, so to have a credible plan of fiscal consolidation that I know that it's quite difficult and sometimes it's quite difficult to enforce the commitment but still, I think that the more, more independent work and, and set up institutions in, within countries, I think that they may help. Regarding those proposals, I also have had the same question. There are many people that say, that many people say, we should protect countries for having an excessive appreciation. But if the US is depreciating and all countries at the same time decided to avoid it, we will have a problem. We will have a problem. And, and all countries will be accused of currency manipulation. And on top of this, I like the proposal of Joe saying countries with a large current account surplus. This was the case of Chile in the, in the commodity boom. Because in order to protect, I, I don't say to, to fight against and to reverse it, but to protect from excessive appreciation, there was some uh, 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 reserve accumulation and with the current account surplus. It was not caused by capital inflows. Many, many countries, and I have some research on that, many, many countries in periods of high terms of trade tend to accumulate for competitiveness reason. And, and this, of course, it creates a problem. I think that as, as of now, and, and the discussion of the proposal of Joe and, and things that we have discussed very long, this takes care of the large economies. And I think that that's, that's kind of important. What's that's Chile or what's that the Asian country? It's not that important, but I still have an, an intellectual a, 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 a problem of saying, well, if all, do, if all small countries do it at the same time, we'll become a very big country. That's terrific. Thank you, Jose. Finally, Kristen, and thank you for sticking with us a couple of minutes past the witching hour. Um, there are so many questions we could ask you, but there have been a bunch of questions from the audience about the role of China in the Paris Club and China's debt holdings in, of, that have accumulated in recent years. Uh, to, to low and middle income countries. First, what is your feeling about what can or should be done to encourage China's bilateral debts to be brought under some umbrella, whether it's Paris Club or something else? And second, whether with respect to China or the Paris Club in general, what do you think is the state of play on creating some of these contingent or variable technical contracts that you and Peter and Jose and everyone is rightly raising, but never seems to be on the agenda. Um, where do you see this going? So first in terms of uh, bringing China more into the international sphere, uh, formal debt renegotiation process, that seems to make a lot of sense. Um, if that could be combined with other reforms or other ways to make it more attractive to get China involved, that might be necessary. Um, but I also can't help but wonder if China will also see the need to become more involved because now they have made a number of loans, whether directly or through state-owned companies, to countries that cannot pay. And they have to deal with this also. Um, so they may, is, is that the share of countries debt that is owed to China becomes bigger and bigger. They may also see it in their benefit eventually to be part of this system. But we wanna see that happen sooner rather than later. So yes, all effort should be made to get them engaged um, and more formally involved. 
Um, second, in terms of the debt contingent instruments, yeah, this is an area where economists all seem to agree. The economic benefits are quite clear. It's just getting these markets sort of jump started and getting them issued. And that is where there is more of a hurdle. There is investor hesitation about whether these debt contingent contracts would be attractive. Um, unfortunately, the sort of textbook case for debt contingent instruments, at least in terms of linking them to GDP growth, seems to be Argentina, which was forced to do these as part of their debt restructuring. And then, of course, Argentina tends to be a little looser with its statistics, and there were issues that came up with that. Um, which are, I think, more unique to Argentina and issues around Argentina's uh, statistics than around state contingent contracts in general. But unfortunately, this has put a bad name on some of these um, discussions about state contingency, and especially linking debt payments to GDP. So we need to move the conversation beyond specific situations with Argentina. And that's where having the IMF World Bank involved, doing it more widely, doing it with their help designing the contracts and signing off on key variables is critically important. The other issue that I think is worth remembering is I remember, gosh, over a decade ago when there was a, uh, the last big round of discussions about restructuring the framework for international debt, um, there was a lot of pushback from the private sector on CACs, collective action clauses. Um, I remember being in meetings where investors claimed if you force us to accept CACs, we'll charge more, the debt will not be attra as attractive, and there was real concern. CACs were issued. There was no noticeable impact on the cost of issuing debt with CACs. CACs have ended up being helpful, as we just heard about, in debt restructurings this time around. So this was a case where a lot of the hype and the concern about changes to contracts um, ended up not being played out. And I think this is where the international community can push a little harder, as they did with CACs. They pushed very hard on CACs against objections by many investors, and it has led to smoother workouts of debt. And it's meant there's that these debt restructurings are handled quickly, more efficiently, and sooner, which means there's more to recover. And I think investors are accepting they can recover more with these uh, clauses in the debt contracts, even though um, by itself they didn't seem attractive initially. So I think that's a very important lesson as we talk about changes now and think about the state contingency and debt contracts. Well, there may be some initial hesitations if they're implemented and done wisely, paying attention to the details and on a larger scale, they could end up being quite a bit more beneficial and not add to cost as much as some worry. Terrific. Thank you, Kristen. My thanks to Kristen, to Joe, to Jose, and to Peter. This has been a terrific session. I encourage everyone to read and distribute the materials, the videos of this event, including, of course, Kristen's full remarks, will be available on our website permanently, or at least as permanently as we can promise anything, uh, starting this afternoon. Uh, and I hope you'll join us next week for more of our Rebuilding the Global Economy series as we continue to address the international organizations in the European community, excuse me, the European Union, the, um, a bit of a throwback there. Um, uh, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, great seeing you.